Um, <coughs> this is involved with medicine, mostly ballooning, but with medicine. Um, I understand you're supposed to do a disclaimer to start with, so my disclaimer is that any time I've said in this lecture that may incriminate me for the GMC could be lies and I deny it in this sort of investigation. <laughs> <laughs> I also received some support from Seats and Healthcare Limited, who make surgical support, I suppose it could be a I think neither the Tory he told you, now I've retired, I think I might need them <laughs> increasingly from this point onwards. Anyway, uh, the talk is about ballooning, how I got into ballooning and how I've tried to squeeze ballooning as a sport uh, into um, my career in medicine. And um, with it, through it, I'll try and show you how it did fit in in your wristband, but it's true as well. Ballooning means different things to different people. In fact, it's interesting that um, one year we were trying to fly over Birmingham on Christmas morning because the airport closed and uh, we went to a hotel which was uh, had some lovely grounds in the right area for us to take off to fly the city and I went up to the reception and I said, uh, can you take some balloons off on your front lawn? And the receptionist said, for ordinary balloons? I said, yeah, it's ordinary balloons. <laughs> so, uh, so we got these, uh, about eight these balloons uh, inflating, and then the manager came around and said, who said you could do this? And I said, well, I did, uh, I did ask the reception. And they said, yes, but it's ordinary balloons. Well, these are ordinary to us. <laughs> she said, well, as long as you take off before my manager arrives, and back forth now. <laughs> the whole hotel enjoyed it anyway. So, so how did I get into ballooning? Well, I went to medical school in Bristol. Uh, I uh, finished by uh, five years there, then went to do house jobs in Western Sydney and uh, in Bath, and I came back to do a three year rotation in, in pathology uh, back at the Bristol Royal Infirmary. I moved back into a flat where uh, I was as a medical student, and there were several people that changed in that flat at that time. Mm -hmm. And there was a person there who, got his, uh, who had just got his bloom license, you needed a bloom license uh, from the Civil Aviation Authority. And he said, in a very cheeky, well, if you come out six, seven times and help me play my loo, we might give you a flight. Uh, so I wasn't that interested in balloon. I'd seen a balloon occasionally, in the early days of balloon, I'd seen a balloon occasionally in the sky over, over Bristol. It seemed to be fairly stationary. You think that gives you a very nice view for a little while, then it must be a little boring, and you wait until you come down. But uh, I was quite interested to see the process of ballooning. And it's only about three weeks later, on a lovely August evening, that we um, that he invited me out, and the other two people uh, that he could he, he, he could drag out at the same time had, uh, were both in the flat, and they both had flights, and they weren't that interested. So um, when we got out there, he said, "This is the, the balloon he had. Okay. It was and the golly balloon from uh, Robertson Jams, as you know, not PC these days." So, <laughs> <laughs> We, we can't produce another balloon like that. But that was very sad actually because we used to go around different schools and one school that they organised to have it, a school in uh, the south of London. And the, when, the, when the council heard that, the council said, no, you can't take it along because it's sort of poor school children uh, all um, lost out there. Anyway, so August uh, 1974, I uh, uh, embarked in the in the balloon because the other two people didn't want to fly. And I, we took off and, and literally it was a perfect evening and I hadn't got over the edge of the, the field. I thought it was a really beautiful way of flying. And at the end of the, the end of the flight, I said, well, how, how many hours do you need to go to the balloon license? He said, 12. I thought, oh, I've got one now already. Uh, but he wasn't going to teach me how to fly and I thought, well, I couldn't afford a balloon. Uh, I thought that it was my one and only chance. Um, and I had to put it down to a, a nice experience. Unbeknown to me at the time, there was a group of people at the hospital who were all uh, clubbing, or, or trying to find five or six people to, to get together to buy, uh, to form a syndicate to buy a balloon. Um, some doctors, some, some laboratory personnel. So um, they heard that I not only might be interested in balloon, but also knew somebody who could teach us. So um, I became a sellable commodity, so, and, um, so, they, uh, so I bought into the syndicate, and as I'd got some aviation experience before, uh, they 
they stay leave it licensed first and you can teach the others how to get uh, their license. So, so we tried to pack in as much flying as we could um, during my, my registrar, I suppose. Uh, that, part of the time I was doing my project at that time, and my colleagues of people, but they, um, they, <laughs> the professor there always got in early on Saturday morning to see how the bugs were growing. I thought it was perfectly all right to allow the bugs to grow for an hour or more longer before we looked at them, which gave me time to go blooming before I, I, I got into to work. Because occasionally you got stationary over somewhere you couldn't land, like the Avon or the trees, and I'd rush in late and he'd say, Later getting there for night, yes, I'm sorry. So, difficult to get him to work, yes, yes, I was. Yes. <laughs> so, but uh, I managed to get my license uh, and, um, uh, and I then turned around and told the. the Start so teaching others to get their licenses. A little bit about history. Blooning it was first aviation, uh, the first ability to get man into the air. 1783. Uh, it was caused by the pressure of war at the time. The, the Napoleon was besieging Gibraltar at the time, 1792, and people thought, well, how can we, how can, how can we break the siege? Is there any way we can go there by air? The two Montgolfier brothers were paper manufacturers and they realised that uh, you produced a uh, closed space that heat underneath it, the uh, object would rise. And after some experimentation, they got to a point where they decided that man could, uh, um, could be hit in the air. Uh, in November 1783, uh, the King Louis of France at the time uh, was going to nominate two prisoners because they thought that the air might to be uh, not very conducive to life of about 30 feet above the air. And so uh, they're going to send two prisons up there to see whether it was safe or not. And it was the Marquis de Long who uh, persuaded uh, the, um, King Louis and uh, the uh, Marquis, and, uh, and he and the Marquis de Rosier both took the place of the prisoners. It was like sending two prisoners to the moon on their first landing, saying, well, in case it doesn't work, that we won't have lost anybody uh, of uh, any significance. Luckily, uh, they, they flew off, um, had a successful flight for about half an hour, and were fated when they came down, and with Larger Rose's uh, jacket being torn off by uh, souvenir hunters. So that was that. Uh, blooming was a bit of a sport. Uh, light and air blooming subsequently developed uh, with, with hydrogen, and that became a bit of a play sport within the 18th and 19th century with, with the experimentation being done. And uh, blooming had really, uh, in the 20th century, um, uh, 20th century died out. And modern hot air blooming then reappeared again because of pressure of war. The American Navy gave a grant to a balloon, a, a company in, in America to develop a balloon. And it was thought that the idea of that was to see if there was a quite stealthy way that you could get across the Iron Curtain into Russia to, to, bring, to get spies across. Uh, it obviously didn't work in that sense because they realised that to produce uh, the, the heat you needed a fairly noisy burner. But uh, it did then allow them to develop into sport using nylon as the fabric and propane uh, to produce the heat. And from then on, um, it uh, took off, as they say. This is the first British balloon uh, that had its uh, maiden flight in 1967. And uh, subsequently, Britain has been at the forefront of actually balloon manufacturing uh, in Europe. Now, I was told after my registrar's job that if you want to uh, continue uh, to seek a career, a good career in uh, in Italy, you should go to America. So I went to South Africa, which is a much nicer place to go. Uh, I got a job as a registrar at the Gorsa School Hospital and uh, sold my share in the syndicate, thinking if I enjoyed ballooning, I would uh, try and try and get back into ballooning while I got back into the UK. I was going to go out there for one or two years. But 
you travel around South Africa and you realise that it's a stunning country uh, with uh, massive amounts of uh, opportunity to, uh, if you wanted to do anything outdoors. There wasn't any ballooning going on in uh, southern South Africa. There was one balloonist, uh, an ex uh, RAF, uh, Royal Naval, Fleet uh, Air Pilot, actually. Uh, who was in Johannesburg, who was trying to make a business in making balloons. And uh, I thought it was such a lovely country to fly over, so I spoke to him, I went up there a couple of times, and uh, he, he tried to help as much as possible. In the end, he, after about a year, he loaned me his, his first balloon, I brought it down to Cape Town. We flew uh, about 30 people in about a month or two, uh, and to try and form a syndicate in, in, in Cape Town, which, which eventually I was successful about six months before mm -hmm. leaving. So we then turned around um, with this balloon, uh, bought a retrieve vehicle, and set about uh, training the other uh, people here. One was a uh, British anesthetist, uh, registrar, one worked at the university, one worked for the train, and we, <coughs> we set about uh, getting them all a uh, balloon license. Uh, and it was, we, we had some really great um, uh, times there. Most of the time, you tried to fly in the morning and evening again before you went to work, and that was very restricted because where we are here, uh, this side of us is Table Mountain, that's False Bay, that side of Table Bay, the other side, and the airport uh, out in front. So you had a very limited area to fly, and we had very limited areas to land, but uh, we, we, we spent a uh, many uh, early mornings or evenings trying to drift as, as much as we can. Occasionally we ended up uh, in the wrong place, this is uh, sort of on the foothills of the uh, Table Mountain really. Uh, luckily we did get the, uh, the vehicle up there to retrieve it. One, one uh, evening my uh, professor, who uh, had visited me, professors from, usually from the States, sometimes from England, uh, and uh, he, he was very generous and uh, to entertain them he'd always look at one of his juniors and say, will you entertain this professor tonight? Will you? So, <laughs> so uh, this professor came out from Texas and he said, uh, right Bearfield, uh, you might take this, um, uh, it was uh, Dr. Gene Hester, um, uh, up for a flight in the balloon. So I said, oh, well, I'm sure we will we'll manage that. So we took off uh, around the corner on the Bosch Common and took off. And the wind was actually taking us out in this direction, and uh, an upper wind allowed us to fly along the coast, and we went, came, came down to land, and the wind swept us out to sea, and we found ourselves about half a mile out to sea. And uh, I, was a bit, I was a bit concerned at that time, because I thought we shouldn't be out there, whereas um, Professor Hester was in the tall phase at all, it was, it was wonderful. Uh, we actually did slowly manage to find a wind that took us back on shore, we landed just about dust with no fuel, uh, just <laughs> close to the beach. But, and she, she thoroughly enjoyed that and said, oh, well, when you came back to England, why don't you come back by Texas and uh, we'll <laughs> so, so she did. It was wonderful. She, she, we got there and she said, it's like all Americans. She said, yeah. So oh, I'm, I'm off for a lecture in, in, um, in, uh, in two days' time in another part of America. But here's the, here's the Here's my house, so here's my vehicle, and here's my credit card. Bye bye bye. <laughs> so I, I use a vehicle and a, and a house, but I didn't use a credit card. In the, in the, in the, um, the, week, the weekend, you could go, it was time to then go across the other side of the Cape Flats and fly uh, in the, the uh, flattish area before the Hot and Fog Mountains. And this was actually a very nice area to live, to, to fly, except, of course, in the summer, in um, in South Africa, when the sun gets up about 3.30, and you have to really fly before the film starts. You have to fly in the first two hours in the morning. So it did uh, get out to get out there. So it was a bit of a struggle after uh, a week's work, a uh, heavy week's work, the hospital to get up at that time in the morning. Uh, so, so we did. What, what's quite amazing is you, you look at a place like that, and you fly for about an hour, you land in what seems to be in the middle of nowhere, and then within about five seconds, about 30 or 40 Africans appear from nowhere. And I never understood. It's the same with the whole of Africa. When we're in flying East Africa, uh, it's the same. We land nowhere and they, they appear from nowhere. And I never understood that. 
Most of the time it would be very safe to fly out here, but occasionally, uh, on one occasion, I did fly uh, down into the, to the vineyard area of, uh, of the Cape uh, area. And uh, as you can see, it's not a very uh, easy place to land when you have these vineyards. And after about 20 minutes, I get a bit concerned. And I saw an area to, to land, and I looked at the scrub area, so I, I bought the balloon down, landed in the scrub field. Uh, to which I then found out that it wasn't a scrub field, it was actually a tobacco field. And it was owned by an Italian. And, and he did come out, and literally there was steam coming out of his ears. <laughs> he didn't seem very pleased. But it was at that time the International Health Board uh, health year. So I thought I'd give my bit of uh, tobacco. Um, so um, that was two years. And then uh, I then tried to find a job back in the UK. And it was not that easy to find a job back in the UK. So I went up to Johannesburg, spent a couple of months up there, and I joined somebody who we were, were flying an advertising balloon uh, over Soweto, uh, the township. This is Soweto, can you see, can't see it very well, because Soweto at that time, which is why they flew advertising balloons over it, had no electricity. So there was no, no televisions, so the only way you could advertise things was well to fly. We were advertising two toothpaste, that was fresh toothpaste for the And so you get up there in the morning and you fly this balloon. And of course, as you can see, because there was no electricity, everybody put their fires on, and there was a massive, this is all that was smoke coming out of all the fire, uh, all the houses in Soweto. So obviously the people who paid us didn't realise that the people down there couldn't see a thing <laughs> because of the smog. But anyway, it provided some degree of um, uh, monetary relief until we got back. And then, during that time, I had uh, saved enough money to buy a balloon, so I came back to uh, to the UK. Uh, again, there wasn't there weren't that many places to uh, there weren't many jobs going. I did a few locums and then ended up getting a, a senior registrar rotation in uh, Leeds. And I was based mainly at St James's uh, University Hospital. I found some crew who came out crew from who used to fly between Leeds and York. They they were both lived in York Way and they, they worked for British Railways, which was quite handy at times because they were getting short a bit of fuel. Somehow they found a propane cylinder lying around occasionally, which is quite useful. So I had to say I was sponsored slightly at times by British Rail. We never noticed it. But we had some exciting flights. Uh, one of the things that, again, I talked to you early on about um, Christmas morning flights, and one of the ones, uh, and again, Leeds Airport closed on Christmas morning, so you had to go and fly on Christmas morning. So, where do you find crew on Christmas morning? Well, the only way you're going to find crew on Christmas morning is you go down to the doctor's mess and see who's just come off duty and say, if you help get my balloon off the ground, because it needs about three or four balloons off the ground, then you might get a flight. So I went down there, and the first person who came out of the uh, mess was the, uh, the on-board psychiatrist. <laughs> and uh, and uh, I, was, I was the hematologist at the time. And I said, well, if you help me get my balloon off the, off the ground, we could uh, open the flight. And we, were, uh, we actually and then ended up flying towards the power station. But we, we took off, we flew. And the first thing we did was fly straight over the psychiatric ward. And uh, we, we heard later was that one of the patients uh, uh, <coughs> hurriedly went to the, to, to the sister and said, my doctor's just flown over the roof. You know, so the <laughs> uh, poor, poor man got another slug of poor phone call. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, we, went, we, went, we flew on and had a, a lovely flight. Uh, <coughs> it was a flight, it was a slow flight. Interestingly, there was very little wind, but this power station was, was producing enough heat to actually just slowly pull us towards it. So in the end, whatever we did to try and avoid it, we were just being moved slowly towards the power station. So we had to land just before that. My other uh, event that occurred while I was up there was um, uh, was my brush with the uh, Civil Aviation Authority. One of my seven brushes with the Civil Aviation Authority. There they are. Uh, you can fly legally, I blue at um, uh, Anywhere, as long as it's 500 feet uh, above a person, vehicle, vessel, or structure, or 1500 feet over a built up area, 
and blue. You can get away with your 500 foot by saying that you're landing somewhere because you land anywhere uh, and you don't land on an airfield. When you're flying over the Humber Bridge, um, Peter Foot said you're coming to land. <laughs> and we had this balloon flight, uh, this blue uh, meet, and they said, uh, somebody said it just as we before we took off. Um, prize for anybody who can drop their glove on the middle of the, uh, of the, of the Humber Bridge. So that's what I like to challenge. So three of us sort of flew low over the Humber Bridge. Uh, we didn't fly underneath it because a helicopter just been fined a thousand pounds flying underneath it with the Lord Mayor of Hull. So we well, we just fly over it because the bridge, the bridge people that saw us uh, way below the height of the, the uh, stanchions. The, the far end was just five hundred feet high. So they reported to the CA, and so so unfortunately we actually had to turn up at Bruff Magistrates Court. So they were all dressed up in their suits and all like this, and came along to Bruff Magistrates Court and. Uh, and there in, in the holding bay, you say all these people who just stole like, other people and mothers up or stole in a car and, and, and uh, saw a few people in these seats. Are you witnesses? Uh, no, 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 but uh, we're the final. They, they left us to the, it's lovely, they left us to the final um, uh, event of, the, of, of their morning and, uh, and, uh, and uh, we got away with a 50 pound fine. So, so there we are. So that was. Um, that was the Humber Bridge. Most of the time, we York, flew around the York Vale. Sometimes we got pulled uh, by a very strong sort of sea breeze uh, and towards the, the Pennines. And one of our flights, we landed, it was quite fast, we, we landed uh, some way into the Pennines. And the tree vehicle, which follows you, has to follow you. At that time, uh, there was no communication. Uh, we landed. And they thought they knew vaguely where, where we were, and, they, and uh, it shows you the, the, the point about asking specific questions. Because, because they came up to this person in this village and they said, Have you seen the bloom land? He said, Oh, yes, yes, I have. And they said, uh, where, where was it? He said, Oh, uh, go, down, go down there, um, and it's about the second lane down there, go down there and by the river. And they, they said, Oddly, they said, um, What colour? Was it light blue and white? He said, Oh, I can't remember it, it was 30 years ago. Ah. <laughs> so, they, they did find this anyway. How we normally, how we normally uh, communicated with each other was, uh, oh, yes, was it by telephone. And uh, this is before mobile telephones, obviously. Uh, and so, so uh, if you lost, if the retrieve lost you, you had to have a common telephone number to ring into. That was very useful being a, a, a doctor because you use the hospital switchboard. <laughs> so you always look around the hospital switchboard, could you act as our retrieve number? Or, and they're always very happy to do that. And, and so if you, you landed, you rang in, and you said where you were, and then and the um, uh, retrieve would ring in and you'd get a hold of yourselves to each other. When we then got hold of two-way radios, of course, you could be on call as well because you have a two-way radio and um, your, uh, your, your bleeper would go off and you'd get a two-way radio and you'd call your retreat. Uh, can you go to the telephone, uh, next telephone box and find out what the hospital wants you for, wants me for, and then they get to the telephone box and they hold, prop the door open like this with the telephone in one hand and the walk talk in the other and they communicate what the ward wanted you about. Because most of it we could do by phone, sort of. So, and uh, it all got delayed that way. Nobody died from that anyway. <laughs> so, uh, okay, so that was retrieving. England is, a, is actually one of the nicest places to, to fly balloons. Uh, most of the time there's somewhere to land. Obviously, there's a lot of copper around. Uh, it's not good like the Bear of York, it's got a lot of crop. But most of the time, you're going to find somewhere to land. You one trouble uh, apart from power wires, which try and avoid it, and pleasant farmers. And occasionally you will come across an unpleasant farmer. Most of them, um, 98% of them, are, are really very pleasant. But you get, you will find these people who are unpleasant. They're people you don't normally meet, meet uh, on a day to day. Living. Even even they're very pleasant to their doctors usually, because you might help them cure them, but uh, or relieve them. But uh, when you see them out in a blue, sometimes you find some unpleasant people. And that, that is sometimes a <coughs> drop pointer about ballooning and 
this put one or two people off blooming in the end. Uh, we could, I continued blooming. I, I then got interested in what is competition blooming as you hear about the World Championships. What competition blooming is about is not actually flying as fast as you can or at first to get to a point. You're using the wings at different heights to navigate you to different points. So, that is, but, but, so the, here it shows you the, the ground wind is in this direction and the upper wind is in this direction. So by going up and down, you then navigate to a preset point. Uh, and then there may be several other points on the way. And obviously you are flying, uh, this, this just shows you, if you can work out the, the vectors, this is a, 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 shows you the different directions of winds with height. And uh, here, you see the wind starts off in this direction as you climb, you get to this point here, uh, which I think, uh, I can't really get from here, but, uh, is, is probably up to 2,000 feet, then changes dramatically in this direction, you go up, and then changes back in this direction. So in certain circumstances, there are some quite dramatic changes in wind direction, and you're using this to, to, to navigate yourself to certain points. This is just a map, uh, a Japanese map, uh, these are uh, uh, kilometre squares, these are. And this just shows you that there was a... Um, this is a flying where you had to go out here somewhere to take off using the winds to get you back to this point and then before you took off there you had to declare a point between there and another point you had to declare by the judges so you then had to find a, a road junction uh, somewhere in between those two and then there was some further tasks down here so there's one, two, three, four, five tasks in this flight and you can see the wind uh, lowish down was in this direction, went high up, you went, came back in this direction, obviously you had to go high up to get from there across to here. And that shows you uh, sort of a typical type of task um, that would be set uh, in the morning. You'd be aiming for a cross in a field, usually near a junction, and the, the idea obviously is to navigate yourself to that point. You are flying a balloon where you're only control is the burner, um, where you go up or down, and the balloon itself has got a mass of about two tons, so there's inertia to the balloon, so if you put the burner on, it's not like um, a car where you get instant or a tiller on a, you know, a yacht, you get an instant response, uh, it will take four or five seconds for that balloon to respond, so you try and navigate a, a, a two, two ton object uh, through a three-dimensional playing field with a lag response to arrive over a cross at a height where you can literally just cross it and drop as well as a streamer as close as you go at the end point and the point here. This is half a metre and as you can see the accuracy uh, uh, as uh, competition pilots uh, have uh, improved. It's got to a point where it's so accurate now that this being able to hold your hand out over the basket is not allowed, you have to drop it from the edge of the basket because otherwise it uh, became a throwing or a, a leaning out exercise. And the uh, scores now, as you can see, there's quite a lot there within the meter, <coughs> and some tasks are a bit, a bit close. Well, as I said, I got into competition blooming. I was uh, fortunate in um, uh, just squeezing into the British team for the Night, the World Championships in Battle Creek in 1982 was held uh, uh, in uh, Michigan, United States. The, the World Championships uh, in, in Battle Creek. Uh, there, it was quite interesting. It was the first time I've been where somewhere where you, you get people from all over the nationalities from all over the, uh, all over the, um, the world. And two to the magnificent men in their flying machines, all the Germans were there in their sort of pristine uniforms. Uh, the, the Italians all arrived in designer clothes. Uh, Japanese, just hundreds of them, were all small, all popped out of the basket. And uh, the, the French were all laid back. It was, it was it's quite fascinating. The, the, the Americans took it all to heart. Hundreds of thousands of people came out and uh, really welcomed us. I thought this was an interesting picture. I mean, there's everybody flying off. This is the Irish team. It looks like they're manicuring their, their fingernails. <laughs> but uh, I didn't ask further. So, my job from uh, after my uh, senior 
rotation and Leeds took me to uh, the Midlands. This is the Spaghetti Junction. Uh, the first thing I did when I looked at a job, if a job came, the first thing I would do is get my air map out to see whether it was feasible to fly. That was the most important thing about the job, was whether it allowed me to go blue. And so, so the Midlands was quite an attractive thing to go in the coast. So I took up a lecturer post at the University of Birmingham and uh, uh, found a place to the west, which was the best place to, to it was the freest area to fly, but nowhere near the airport. Um, and then from there, I got uh, a, my consultant job at uh, what then was now uh, called City Hospital, and it was called Dudley Road Hospital, you might have heard of. Um, they, were, they, were, they, had this, uh, they decided to rename the hospital because they said a lot, lot of visiting people used to go to Dudley and ask where the road hospital was. <laughs> but anyway, so because they, they thought they wanted to be associated with Birmingham, they'd get rid of the name of the road. I, I, and it's people coming up with very many different names. The name of the hospital used to be, and I, I like the retro, you know, there's always this retro, you know, cars going retro. And I thought we should have go back with our name and the retro. Because the hospital used to be called West Birmingham Workhouse in Birmingham. I thought that had a really nice tinge to it because it, um, it still it still operated that out of the old workhouse at, at times. It has, I don't know if you noticed in the press now, is being replaced by a hospital in Smithic, uh, which is going to be called the Midland Metropolitan Hospital. So if you think that the, 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 the government is still keen on us developing the American way of uh, doing poor medicine, uh, that might be an indication. Anyway, um, City Hospital, uh, I started there, I was single-handed haematologist. Uh, at that time I was, I got some sponsorship from Seton Sport and Leisure, and actually not for, maybe not for medicine, I, I just sent out, I was very keen to get some sponsorship ballooning, it cost quite a bit of money, and I wrote uh, letters to every company, believe it or not, in the ABPI, that they should be paying me. That's what it was, the same letter. Uh, there's about 100, 120 of them all together, and Pro Sports only in there. Uh, Seaton were only in there because they make Quinnage and Managers, which I've never used, um, but I don't know. Uh, it's owned by the Managing Director and Chairman uh, of the company, which is the S in the Seaton, Norman Stoller. Uh, he used to have a, his second house on the shores of Lake Windermere, and he used to see balloons flying up there from the balloon, local blooming, and his PR, he just sucked his PR man. Uh, and my letter actually arrived on his desk, and he thought it was always nice to have his name, the name of his company on, on my balloon. So that's, and he, he very quickly um, sponsored me and start off with uh, a balloon. The balloon all sits, sits in this uh, van, it all falls away into a van, it was an insane van, uh, which uh, it was very nice, it didn't quite fit into the consultant's car park, so I bought those down. So, from there, I, I remained in the British team and we, one of our next uh, events was the European Championships in, in Poland. Uh, and I was, I was, Poland was, it was kind of 1988 and Poland was still behind the, the, the wall, the Iron Curtain. And it was quite an interesting drive in there because you had to drive over there with, 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 with all the equipment. And it was very much like driving from the colour to black and white, a very dull com com country. But I was quite, quite like the idea of communism at that time because, because the whole of the country is owned by the state. But they just, or the people, they just say, well, you can take off the land everywhere, anywhere you want. Where you've got permission to take off the land anywhere. So I thought it was a very good idea, actually. So it almost tempted me to, to communism at that time because um, I, you certainly didn't have any uh, unpleasant farmers because they couldn't project digital permission. On the way back, is where I won the European Championship uh, for the first time. And on the way back, we're going through the, the wall uh, between the East and West Germany, and, and the border guards were keen to see the, uh, the, the trophy. And they looked at the trophy and they said, Well, why didn't you fly back? 
I thought, well, they're obviously short of target practice. <laughs> <laughs> so there you are. Yeah, so uh, the, uh, this is the, next year, the, the European Championships in, in, in Austria. The European Championships every two years, they last for about five days. Uh, as, as a single-handed hematologist, I would leave at the very last minute, rush over there with all the equipment by road, and fly there, and then uh, come back uh, to uh, the, your, your job as much as you can, try and fit it all in. The, the, the World Championships is, is the world. Uh, world Championships are every two years on the alternate year. So you have the Europeans and the Worlds and the Europeans and the Worlds. And the, the Europeans have about 60 or 70 balloons in them. The Worlds have up to 100 balloons in them. Again, if the, the, the Worlds are, which is all in battle in, in America, uh, in Europe, the, and the other common places being Japan, and occasionally you either get your balloon shipped out there, air freighted out there, or you try and borrow a balloon out there in Japan. It's very, it's very, very popular uh, pastime in uh, sp aviation sport in Japan, and often you could get higher, even higher would be the end of the balloon out there. By working my way up in the world ranking or so, uh, the next thing I was invited to was uh, a, an event in Jordan with the 50th accession of the throne of the then King Hussein of Jordan, who subsequently died. And he wanted uh, 50 of the top balloonists in the world to come and fly their balloons um, in the desert um, for his, for his uh, 50th celebration. So this is what he won. We were all invited out there, which we, they paid for our balloons to go, go out there. They lent us the Jordanian army to retreat for us, and they brought the Inter Intercontinental Hotel. He came down and provided the food in the middle of the desert. It's all very interesting. Um, <laughs> and we got there, and uh, we got there three or four days beforehand. We had these practice flights in the morning. Uh, in the in Wadi Rum, and in the evenings, the because of the thermic activity in the daytime, the evenings were virtually unflyable. And there were we expecting in two days' time to inflate our balloons in front of the king and fly off, especially uh, in the late afternoon. And so the time came. Uh, Marquis all put up there. All the dignitaries arrived. He arrived in his helicopter. Uh, we sat there, we laid the balloons out flat, how uh, dust storms and dust devils occurring, we thought there's no way we can then get this balloon up, but we have to do something. This camel squadron came along, the camel squadron did their, did their bypass, and then it's just, uh, we were supposed to be next, and just as the last camel left out of eyesight, the wind dropped. Amazing. And we all just took off in the middle of the afternoon. Um, and had a superb event, pleased him, we got in all the, in the uh, international press. And the next day, uh, at that time, winds were just totally unplayable. So, whatever the king had, I don't know, but it worked. So, there we are. The other one I should talk about is, apart from the Europeans and the world, is the World Air Games. You know, there's no aviation sport in, in the Olympics. So, they have tried to produce uh, the World Air Games, which is all the aviation sports coming together and doing the same sort of thing like the Olympics, but without people running around tracks, but only doing something in the air. And the first one was in 1907 uh, in Turkey. We were in Cappadocia. It worked very well for blooming. We had quite a, a really good time there in Cappadocia. The trouble was, yeah, it wasn't quite a World Air Games because all the other sports were scattered all over the other places of Turkey. We never saw them, and uh, the opening and closing ceremonies were really conducive to blooming because we had to get up so early in the morning that uh, the opening ceremony in the evening was uh, 200 miles away, it wasn't much use to us. But it was a fantastic event for us, and they have tried to continue with the with World Games, and we'll see that. Now, Obviously, uh, children come along, um, and you think, well, how, how you, what should we do? So we thought we'd collect our 
uh, first born from the maternity hospital. So, uh, so Stephanie was born in uh, Worcester, and we flew to the balloon and dragged the balloon to the front of the maternity hospital. And Harry and my wife and uh, Stephanie got in the basket and we flew off. We didn't go quite home because the wind wasn't in the right direction. But um, that, that worked. And then uh, two years later, uh, Dominic was born and we thought we'd do the same thing. So we inflated this balloon in the car park, decided to drag him towards the maternity entrance. And this uh, dog's worth from the uh, security came along and said, What are you doing? What are you doing? And we said, Oh, we're just collecting a patient from uh, the hospital. He said, What? Well, uh, emergency? Well, he said, Yeah. He said, I was here two years ago. Can't be coming. Interesting, the first time, first time I had to sign a waiver. Right? I mean, uh, your midwife can take the child uh, to a car with four tyres and never no tea, and that's perfectly all right. But you take the child to a balloon and I had to sign away the same they had they weren't at all responsible. Anyway, so as soon as Stephanie was born, uh, we took a picture of her and got a passport because we were off to the World Championships in Canada, and that's how Stephanie enjoyed the first uh, competition uh, uh, in Canada um, from the back of the van. As they grew up, uh, the they were very keen to, to follow us uh, around the world and, and try and do their bit. That was dangerous, but I'm sure um, we didn't do this stuff in the end. And so they, they, <coughs> we didn't try and push them into ballooning, and uh, they, they, they sat on the top of the cylinder, we strapped them in, and they had occasional flights. Uh, but we weren't, we weren't trying to push them in, into this. this and we'll see, see what happens. It, well, later on in 1997, this is in, in Japan, and uh, I was fortunate there to win the World Championships. So, as you see, there's over 100 balloons in that event, and that's sort of this, here we were doing a fly in where you had to find the wind to fly you back to the, the first target, and this is all the British team waiting to take off. But from that, uh, I was offered sponsorship then, uh, the Pro Sports Sponsorship had. I, uh, after 15 years, it had come to an end. And I was offered sponsorship by uh, a Spanish manufacturer of balloons called Ultra Magic. And they, uh, they're a lovely group. They, they live uh, in uh, Iguarda near, near Barcelona. And they got into ballooning uh, in a very, very odd means. They were Sitting, uh, they just driven up their, their bike to Kilimanjaro, and they said, "What should we do next?" And they said, "Oh, I just read this book, Five Weeks in the Balloon by Jules Verne, which is of course all fictitious, which does involve Doctor Ferguson, the British doctor, flying a balloon across Africa." And they said, "Oh, let's do that." And they said, "How are we going to do that?" Oh, we better know something about balloon. So they knew nothing about balloon, nothing about Africa, nothing they knew a bit about Africa. They didn't know anything about balloon. Um, so I'll just pass that. That's the, the, the book they, they wrote on it in the end. But the first thing they had to do was, was build a balloon. They didn't know how to build, build a balloon. So, so they borrowed a balloon and saw how it was made. And they, they got the whole of Iguarda to help them produce this balloon. And they went out to, uh, to Africa. And Dr. Ferguson, in the British book, he was going to fly from Zanzibar, so he thought, if they want to do that, we'll do that. So they went down to Zanzibar, 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 um, and they flew um, across uh, Africa. The wind is supposed to, the, the trade winds are from the east and should fly you in this direction. And they actually flew across in this direction and down here, these are their little trips, and they ended up in the Zealous Game Reserve here. And they said, well, when do the east, is, uh, when do the, the Southeast was going to take place, and they said, oh, any time now. So they sat there for a couple of weeks, waiting for that to happen. But as you can see, over hops, and they just flew off uh, and landed, and they then had to trip the people, as well as people pop out of, it, out of nowhere, and they said, we'll just come and we'll pay you some money to come collect some gas for us. So, and they had to collect hot uh, propane cylinders, and they, they, they trundled all the way across here, all around the um, into the Congo, and they just stopped because the trade wind, they were at the equator then, and the trade winds 
just stop and they realise that's as far as they'll get. So they bought a second hand vehicle because they didn't have any vehicle, they were just going by themselves. They flew with their tent in it, a sewing machine, but twice they got the blue tent, they ripped it to pieces, and they just bought a vehicle and, and, and then flew back. And then from there they, they thought they'd produce, uh, they'd uh, get going to blue manufacturing, and they eventually wrote, wrote a book about their, their story. And 25 years later, they, they took their company and some of their pilots out to Zanzibar and they thought they'd do one or two of these trips uh, in, in, in recognition. So we went out to Zanzibar, this is an air, uh, and we, uh, the wind at the time wasn't at all obvious it was going to take us across here. We were supposed to fly in this direction here, but the wind was really quite light and we we weren't sure, and we, they only then allowed two or three balloons to take off in case they all had to ditch and so we could come and rescue two or three balloons, but not more than that. That was a bit of a lie anyway, I didn't get rescued any of us. Anyway, so we set off. <laughs> we set off, we started going in this direction, we thought, oh, we might reach up there. And slowly the wind came across in the right direction. Here we got a little bit worried because this, there was a bit of a small squall came along here and we started going along here, we managed to get rid of that by changing our height. And we, we actually even, eventually ended up up here, not down here. And uh, from the air, you can see this is the coastline here, we came in down here and we're using the uh, um, skill and competition blooming uh, with all these trees, thorn trees around, we came down and landed down here uh, in this village. And that is the one beautiful thing about blooming, is that you, you, you arrive somewhere and this, this village could have been uh, totally unchanged from when Livingston walked through it. We didn't walk through this one because it was yeah. further down. So we really walked through it. But it's but it completely unchanged. With, if you go to tourism, as soon as a tourist bus arrives at a typical village, that typical village ceases to be a typical village as soon as the first tourist bus has arrived. Because every adapts themselves to what the tourist wants. And so in Ballooning, you actually just get dumped anywhere where people, you know, you're just a, a welcome visitor and you are treated as such. And you see, you see the, the land um, and the people as, as they are. And it's wonderful. And it's wonderful because this, this first, the, the following what we went down to another village further down where, where they could push us up. And the, the next, the next uh, morning we, we were invited to go and see the village. What was the administrator or elder as such? And, um, First of all, I think he was impressed that he might have balloonists. Then he realised he wasn't impressed because not only did he have a balloonist who landed there, but they were supposed to be landing at Barangwala, about 200 miles to the further south. So this person had got no idea and he landed miles away from where he was supposed to land. So not only did he have a balloonist, he was a rubbish balloonist and he couldn't direct his balloon in the right direction. So he looked very disappointed. Anyway, so from there, um, we went down, the second part of the thing was that you sell us games of, so what you do, you hire your, your own train, believe it or not. We hire, uh, Magic hired this train, we put propane cylinders in uh, and the balloon baskets, and we went off down to the sell us game reserve and had uh, some wonderful flights there. Interestingly, they came across, one of these chaps uh, had seen their balloon 25 years ago flying. And he thought, I'm going to build a balloon. And he, was, he, he took the, the ultra magic people down to his house, and he still had the balloon there. It was made out of thick, sort of thick rubberized fabric, which he would have never got off the ground. And he showed a fan that he'd sort of made up to himself. And he got to the point where he'd blown a bit of air into it, but not much further than that. Uh, but he, it, didn't, it inspired him to try, and he was a teacher, he was a local teacher at the school, and it inspired him to try and make a balloon. So there you are. Their next uh, expedition was uh, Kilimanjaro. So I'll take a little bit. Do you remember what I put on? Right. Um, Kilimanjaro. Uh, so again, we, had a, we were going to fly over Kilimanjaro. We all, we all had uh, these uh, vehicles here uh, to drive around, and, and the balloons. Uh, or fitted into uh, a truck. What you have to do, of course, again, is that because you go with the wind, you have to find out where the wind's going, so that involved wind going in the wrong direction, or the right direction, but we were in the wrong place. So we had to drive right the way around, around the base of Kilimanjaro to find a place that would be suitable for us to take off. 
And there aren't very many places to take off from. You have to look for schools, and this is school ground. And this was vaguely in the right direction, but two of us actually went further round to a more suitable place for the wind direction. You get your, we got the balloons out, and then we could have to fly over, the, over Kilimanjaro and land the other side, hopefully before the afternoon uh, thermal stop in too difficult to the idea is to take off very early in the morning. So, so we got the balloons up uh, at six o'clock, just as uh, just as day was breaking, and uh, flew up towards uh, Kilimanjaro. Kilimanjaro is just, uh, just below twenty thousand feet. And, so uh, we, we all had oxygen with us to fly over it, and the wind actually allowed us to go straight over the crater. Uh, and uh, this was, unfortunately, we were about, it'd be nice to be a bit lower. We were about 6,000 feet over that to get over the crater. Some balloons that came later flew along the edge of it, um, and being lower it just shows you the, the size of the. Uh, Kilimanjaro compared to the balloons. What's very sad, of course, is that if you remember that picture, first picture first of Kilimanjaro and what up uh, snow on it, this is virtually uh, what snow is left now, and they reckon with global warming that, the, that all that ice uh, would have melted within the next five years. It won't be as we all remember it. So uh, the, the, uh, we then had another part into this is going to we, we had another little trip down to a uh, uh, game park in Tangerine, Tang Tangiri. We were supposed to go and fly in the Ngora Ngora crater, but um, like everywhere, you need all the special permissions, and you, you can't get the special permissions you do. So we went down to this, and uh, this uh, safari park. And uh, flew, and the second time we flew, we flew towards a uh, what's called a forest called Rundi, which is just mm -hmm. those trees down there. Uh, and it's a not very easy place to, to land, and you had to land on one, really, this last track before the river was very little else. And so we landed, you can see, we, we landed there. There's a group of us, it's quite a large balloon, and this is a photographer, and uh, this is one of the um, organizers. Pilot, and, this is the, the pilot. and we landed on here, and we thought, oh well, we'll just wait for the for the retriever to, to pick up. So we, we packed the balloons away, and then we heard this vehicle arrive coming down the track. We thought that must be there. It's surprising. So we went behind all the trees, uh, and we thought, oh, well, pants out. And, and this this vehicle was no uh, land Toyota Land Cruiser like that. We could hear it. And so as it arrived, we all jumped out the bushes and went, oh, like this. It was full of Japanese tourists. <laughs> <laughs> it wasn't ours at all. Because the Japanese tourists had just been convinced that they were in the middle of nowhere and the next thing they would see would be a rhinoceros or a lion and they saw all these man Englishmen so, and, and, and uh, Spanish people. And, and I'll never forget the expression on their faces. They thought we were mad. <laughs> there are. Right. Uh, three years ago, we uh, we then had a trip to Mongolia. This is just a map of Mongolia showing where, how, how big the Mongol Empire was. Um, this is down here. This shows you where, interesting, where all the Mongol uh, uh, languages were spoken. Anyway, we, we flew for in one or two bits of Mongolia. The nice thing about Mongolia is uh, there's no farmer problems. There's about two million people live in Mongolia, and about a million of those live in Ulaanbaatar. Mm -hmm. The others are scattered over nowhere. So you can literally go for, 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 for miles without seeing anybody. Uh, and this ground is absolutely wonderful because it is just like a billiard table, and you can just drive straight across anywhere without fear of uh, hitting any rocks or, or holes at all. But it's very nice. It's quite nice to fly because you, you, you know these mountains are miles away. Uh, but you don't see much of them there, of them playing. But you do go to other places, you went to Karakurum, is the Zoom monastery, and this shows you where the uh, Genghis Khan's capital was, which, which you would naturally not be able to appreciate it from anywhere else except the air. It was only from the air that you can actually see the main high street and road uh, through this. It's, the splits of it are being um, investigated archaeologically. But it, it was a, a brilliant place to see it. We also saw the Flaming Cliffs of back 
and so on, um, which is where uh, Roy, Roy Captain Adams found the dinosaur eggs, which is a very, very um, famous place for, for dinosaurs, and uh, again, quite spectacular to see from the air. We then, then went up into the mountains, and we used these um, these Russian the balloon windies, and the bit, all the gas had to follow us. We were in trucks, which were difficult at times in muddy water. Um, we used these these Russian uh, mini buses, which were amazing because because this is quite deep water, as you see, and they they went through these quite easily. They all ran on 87 octane uh, petrol, believe it or not, stuff that none of our vehicles would ever run on, uh, and. Um, but they were quite reliable. This this you see so as the tourists going in the direction, as you can see by the lack of weight, they didn't get very far, so we had to tow, we had to tow them, them out. <coughs> this time of year, um, a lot of people go up to, to the Alps and we've flown in the Alps. Uh, again, it's stunning scenery in the Alps. Uh, my wife uh, flew over the Alps uh, when she was six months pregnant. Um, I'm sure it didn't do. Stepney and Eagle Harbour Tour, um, actually 12,000 feet. Um, uh, but uh, we, we had some, uh, we've had some nice flights. This is from Chateau Day a couple of years ago. In Switzerland now becoming rather too expensive for the balloon. But last year we went to the Pyrenees, um, and this is a flight over the Pyrenees. And here we're about 15,000 feet, which I've decided is about my limit of, 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 of hypoxia. I, I did actually do an aviation medicine course and I went into one of these chambers to see uh, what, uh, how a uh, hypoxia would affect me, but I have an embarrassing, <laughs> embarrassing admission to say that I, they, they asked me to put my oxygen mask back on because what I was doing sanely, they thought I was hypoxic. <laughs> they asked me to do this trick and, I, and, and the, the trick ended now and to, to, to redo the trick I had to take some some uh, ball bearings at the bottom of this track, which I thought was hypoxic, but I wasn't, it was working as work. the only logical way to do it. But anyway, <laughs> so I never found out what, how I'd be affected hypoxic. But anyway, this is 15,000 feet over the Pyrenees. It was a lovely, uh, it was a small little uh, balloon meet with seven people we flew over the Pyrenees. And then uh, down in the foothills of the Pyrenees, down towards Lurida, there were these beautiful um, gorges which you just don't see from the road and very difficult to access uh, by, by foot as well but beautifully accessible by balloon as long as you can fly out there and land somewhere safe and we had some really stunning uh, trips down these um, gorges. This is the other thing we managed to do last year and this is a trip across London for the Lord Mayor's Regatta. We raised £75,000 for the Lord Mayor's Regatta by flying moons over to London again. It had to be a certain, we could only fly in a certain arc, arc across, uh, so we didn't affect the airports. It had to be above, a thousand feet above London um, and 1,500 feet below 1,500 feet because that was the, the airway into Heathrow. So again, a uh, bunch of experienced balloonists. And we, it was a stunning day you can see we flew uh, across uh, south uh, towards the, the North Downs and very spectacular. Uh, next year, um, uh, the World Championships are back in Japan. This is another view of Japan. Uh, it's, it's, um, flying in Japan is in, Japan is either all trees on hillsides or built up areas, and there's only a short uh, the only place you can land in really is in um, rice fields, so uh, you can only fly in November when the rice has been harvested. Uh, but uh, at that time, you get some beautiful colours in the, in the trees. Um, it's uh, quite stunning, and they organise some really, really wonderful balloons, but extremely well organised. Um, this, uh, finally, is just to show um, my, my children have uh, come this a few years ago, but, but this is uh, my ch two of my children now uh, flying balloons and have a really big rate of sport with young people coming into it and capture other people into it. This just shows you here that we fly now with, uh, before we used to fly with just with a paper map, now we fly with GPS and a moving map, which is our rather level playing field. You, 
you know exactly where you are, where you're going, which direction, and the speed, and your estimated time of arrival at uh, certain points, which might have time limits on them. So it has made flying uh, much easier. We all have um, radios as well, and um, that's most, most instru instrumentation. Uh, last, uh, in December, we went to the fourth World Air Games, which was in Dubai, and um, this is an extremely well uh, sponsored event. Um, they virtually paid for the moon to get out there, pay for accommodation and food. Uh, again, they brought in the organising team, which is the World Championship, so uh, the, uh, it was uh, well organised. Uh, we flew uh, with a sea breeze in the evenings uh, off the uh, palm and off the island out over the city, and then the um, uh, evenings we sometimes flew the other way. It, uh, it was quite spectacular. Uh, uh, unfortunately, uh, what you need is places to put crosses to aim for, and, and so there weren't that many opportunities. Uh, once you get out of the city, it's all sand, and, it's, and you can't drive in the sand. So uh, there we had some spectacular flying. Uh, there weren't that many um, uh, opportunities to set a good composition tasks. But uh, they brought all the blooms together and, and we all had a, a, a good time. Brings me back to where I live now, and that's Cookley. Just a quick um, uh, two minutes about how I, how I got involved in village life. Uh, I came along one evening and took off from our planning, uh, went to take off from our planning fields, and these committee people came out and said, You can't take your room off from the planning fields, you're not allowed to. Subsequently, I found out I could have done, I didn't know at the time. I uh, thought, if you can't beat them, join them. So I put my name down to join um, the, uh, the committee um, and went along to the first committee meeting, which was wonderful. It was better than the people did. I mean, I thought, why do I want to watch people do it? I can go down to our village and see the whole thing in real life. And uh, one of the first meetings I went to, they spent an hour discussing how long uh, and how often they should cut the grass. And I thought, this sounds good. They've only had it this for 50 years now, and they're discussing this now. So, anyway. Uh, <coughs> the trouble is, is that their changing rooms were so dilapidated, both the local football and cricket league said that they wouldn't be allowed to play any sport on their playing fields next season unless they could be done with their changing rooms. And so I, uh, they thought, oh, well, what we'll do is uh, put in a bid. And I thought, I'm oh, too, too busy at work, too busy balloon in, and this is too much work. I'm not going to stand back from this, I'm not going to get the goal. I slowly thought, they're only going to have one chance at this, and they're not going around this right way. I better help facilitate. So, so I reluctantly decided to join in, and so um, we. Uh, I, I helped them uh, arrange, and we got um, two, £230,000 for the new changing rooms, which were built there. And then subsequently, um, at the same time, they had planning permission to put multi use games area in there. So after four years, the planning permission was falling down on that. So uh, we, we got together again and raised £160,000 for the multi use games area there. And then uh, our parish hall was just over here, and that was closed down and dilapidated. And the vicar, knowing that we'd been fairly successful here, came to me and said, "We think we could help um, build help build a new uh, village hall, and we will have some money from the sale of that land." And so, uh, because I wasn't one of the warring parties in our village, and didn't represent anybody, because I just went to uh, I managed to facilitate getting all the various parties together and involved in the, the, um, the, the so Sports and Social Club, which, which is in this building here on charitable land, the charity people, the, the, the church and everything else. And uh, we raised, uh, in the end, raised about a million pounds and built a, a, a hall and we used the building for a bit of publicity here and here we are putting the weather vane on top of the, uh, on top of the, uh, uh, um, and, uh, and that was all we, we got built in at the end, uh, which took a few years off my life because it all worked out well in the end. 
Silly roll. Uh, just, uh, just to end up with, uh, I have just uh, have to say uh, give, um, thanks to Norman Scholar, who was just knighted in, in this year New Year's Honours list for his, his um, giving quite a few million pounds to charities in Manchester. And he supported me over three balloons over 15 years in balloons, which helped me a lot. And obviously, after that, Ultra Magic, uh, who uh, uh, sponsored me a bit now, and uh, my son. And um, uh, what's, what's, somebody says, what, what do you enjoy about being able And I said, though I try and, and fly in the direction I want to fly, often kind, but I say that. My philosophy in ballooning is that uh, I've got no idea where I'm going, but uh, I might as well enjoy it. <laughs> <laughs>
countries. You made it sound all nice and gentlemanly, but are there dirty tactics involved? I mean, you see the mass <laughs> launches. You take somebody there, or you know. Um, yeah, no, it's no, no, it's all very gentlemanly. I mean, you still will find some people who will try and cheat in any sport. Unfortunately, luckily, there's no money. Uh, it's all honour. Uh, there's very little money involved in the uh, and prize money. Though know, you go to Japan and um, their prize money is up to nearly twenty thousand pounds, so it's, it's quite good. But but uh, it is very hard if now with with um, the rules and the, your judge, the, the, the organisers and the officials. It's, it is quite difficult to 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 cheat. You have. Uh, you have GPS which tracks your flight so you know exactly where that plane has been um, and uh, there will be people observing your market drops. Um, the, the steaming other people's air is difficult, uh, but obviously when you're moving into a target, um, a hundred balloons all trying to line up against the target and these balloons all moving in, you will be pushing against each other and, and getting into each other's way. Yeah. So it was a bit of tactic. Right. Right. While you've been describing your journeys, you said we have got there. So how many people do you are you travelling with to get the uh, We always say that an ideal crew, ideal team is four people, <coughs> right? Which is with you, um, you need you can get a balloon off the ground with three of you. Uh, four of you is, is ideal. That allows one person to retrieve in the vehicle and then one person to navigate while the one person is driving. So you can navigate and see the balloon and look at the map and tell the driver where to go. So there's two people in the vehicle. And then there's you and then often you may have a subsequent person in the, in the basket as well, which is very useful, especially with uh, modern Ballooning, where you are looking often at your at your computer, and some of these tasks you need another pair of eyes this, uh, in a competition for safety. Thank you. Yeah. How safe is ballooning? Ballooning is one of, it is the safest aviation sport. I mean, if you look at the if you look at uh, statistics. Uh, there are very few deaths that occur in ballooning, very few in England. The last one was probably over 10 years ago. And uh, in the, the work that deaths occur mostly from power line accidents. And in, in America, the power wires are, remain on, and the, several people do get electrocuted in America a year, three or four. There's a, there's a, about a thousand, there's about 800 balloonists in the UK, about 8,000 in America, and um, two or three fatal accidents occur in America per year. But in the UK, uh, it's the power wires trip out, and the only, there's been two power accidents causing deaths in the UK in the last 40 years, the two people, and both times it's because the power wires cut. The cable and the basket's tipped over and the person has dropped down. I mean, I'm into little aeroplanes. I mean, how many days of the year can you actually fly? Is it that would drive me nuts? Yes, <laughs> yeah, it, it does get frustrating. I mean, certainly the weather the, just recently has been very poor. Yeah. 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 It, we would, obviously, commercial people who fly for a living. Work out they can fly probably, which is quite surprising, um, probably a third of the time. Mm. Um, but obviously, what was always irritating is you, if you are working, you have a lousy weekend and you go back to work on Monday and it's beautiful weather. Mm. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. How many hours have you got? Uh, I've got uh, three and a half thousand. Mm. Sorry, just a few questions. You said that you thought 15,000 feet was about your limit. What's yeah. the highest altitude you've ever flown to oh. accidentally? Or, or <laughs> <laughs> the highest I've been to is 32,000 feet. Uh, that, um, there are certain badges that you can get in ballooning. One of them is to go up to um, 
6,000 meters, 18,000 feet, no, uh, sorry, uh, 9,000 meters, 27,000 meters, 38. So we're up to 32,000. Uh, obviously, you need oxygen above 15,000. And the reason why you stop at 32,000 is because the burner itself needs oxygen, and that's when the burner went down. That's what that was saying. Yes, yeah, yeah. yeah that, I mean, obviously, at 32,000 feet, you're into the upper airway space, and you have to have special permission because you're up amongst all the airlines. <laughs> and on your, on your photos, the baskets are on their side. Is that because you push them in rattles, or the vast majority of your landing, the landing then where the basket get toppled uh, over? Or? Uh, to, to inflate the balloon, you, you start on the side, and yeah. you put cold air in, and inflate that. If you're landing, if the wind's above five miles an hour, uh, the basket will tip over. It's only below five miles an hour that the basket will land upright. Uh, your, your, your safest, uh, again, what stops you flying is wind and rain. Wind, uh, you, you need the wind to be really less than 10 miles an hour to take off, and you can land with winds of up to 20, 25 miles an hour. And that's about it. Above that, you shouldn't be flying. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's, it's interesting. Yes, it is. It's, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, just following on the first question there about the um, glasses sticking over, I may be wrong, but I think in the last picture of the Ultra Magic Ball, it looked as though they were trying to reverse it. Is that right? No, that's so straight. Yeah, we were trying to reverse it. It's made in America, which I don't know, I think they've stopped right now. I was just wondering what, what they were like to land on the reversing machines. Yes, I don't think, I've never thought of trying to reverse it in those conditions. Yeah. We hear about people like Richard Branson doing extreme balloons. Yes. Uh, what what is the difference in what your thought of that and what his and his colleagues do with that? Right. Well, the, the, he was into record breaking for, for a mainly a for publicity and obviously to get his name in history in aviation. Uh, his he um, obviously for that you need money and um, money and money. As you know, he didn't succeed in going around the world. He was beaten by two very nice people, Bertrand Pickett and Brian Jones. And I was able to, we were mostly in the balloon community we were pleased that they did it because uh, uh, they they were more uh, a balloonist, balloonist. Uh, Richard Branson, as I say, is a, is a bit of a, an attention seeker. And uh, his, his problem, the reason why they didn't succeed, interesting enough, is they backed Lindstrom balloons to produce a balloon for them to fly around the world, as long as they only made a balloon for Richard Branson and Paul Lindstrom. The other competitor, both British, was Cameron Balloons, and Camerons made balloons for several people who tried to make them around the world, because every time somebody failed, they actually improved their product, and that is what succeeded. Branson, because they didn't didn't have that number that they could make to keep on preparing it, allowed Camerons to, to get the Cameron, which you have to say your hat off was a brilliant design uh, to, to see, to, to get those two to get around the world. And so what were the systems they used to keep them afloat? Right, what they use is, is, is um, what they're using is a lighter than, a lighter than air gas. The trouble with lighter than air gas is that uh, in, in the evening, it, uh, sun goes down, cools, uh, and then it drops. So you have to release ballast, and then in the following morning, the helium heats up, and you go up, and you then have to release helium before you go too high. And the same, the same days you do that before you go out ballast. So what, what the answer to that is, you get your helium, and then at night you heat it up. So you get propane with you and you heat it up, and so you can keep going as long as you've got helium to keep heating your hydrogen, as long as you've got propane to heat your helium at night, as long as you've still got propane left. And, and that was the weight limit, that was the limit there, and they, they reckon they, they actually flew for three weeks, which is which the limit, as you know. <laughs> well, 
very much indeed for uh, coming to Nottingham. It's great honour for us here. And I have to say, I was pretty upset for you to start with. I waited outside for 20 minutes, looking up. But probably not a bad thing, because I've been wheel clapped or bastard. I have so many drive blood clubs, I've been done. Thank you for a, a wonderful uh, talk, and I think one of the actions I'm going to take from this lecture is I'm going to write to Jeremy Hunt to say that the room name is something that should be used for all called doctors at the UK. Should be the new contract, otherwise it'll be more striking. Thank you very much. Uh, the talk has been wonderful, and uh, I think Tony Mitchell, who is our foundation professor, has us greatly revered a still. Uh, would have been completely absorbed like the rest of us from the talk. And what was certainly a field that some extremely tricky questions at the end. Uh, so thank you very much for coming. Uh, the occasion is commemorated by the presentation of a medal, uh, which will be dwarfed by all your other uh, cups and things on your shelf. But please put it in the middle and hold it in high regard. Thank you very much.